celebrate your victory Jesus we revel in your love Jesus we rejoice you set us free Jesus your death had for us life Jesus we celebrate Jesus we celebrate your victory Jesus we revel in your love Jesus we rejoice you set us free Jesus your death has brought us life it was for freedom that Christ has set us free no longer to be subject to a yoke of slavery Now we're rejoicing in God's victory Our hearts responding to His love Jesus, we celebrate your victory Jesus, we revel in your love Jesus, we rejoice you set us free. Jesus, your death has brought us life. To us, to you, Lord. To you, the blind will see. To you, the mute will see. To you, the dead will rise. To you, all hearts will pray. Screams, I am free. Yes, I am free. To you, the blind will see. To you, the blind will see. To you, the mute will sing. To you, the dead will rise. To you, all hearts will praise. To you, the darkness flees. To you, my heart screams, I am free. Yes, I am free to run. Yes, I am free to dance. Yes, I am free to live for you. Yes, I am free. Yes, I am free. I am free to run Yes, I am free to dance Yes, I am free to live for you Celebrate your victory, Jesus. We revel in your love, Jesus. We rejoice you set us free, Jesus. Your breath has brought us life, Jesus. We celebrate my last time, church. We celebrate your victory. Jesus, revel in your love, Jesus, we rejoice you set us free, Jesus. Yes, Lord, this, this morning we declare your praise, Lord God. We worship you this morning. You are worthy of all our praise and honor that we have to give, Lord. Father, this morning we declare all things were made through you and by you, Lord God. You are supreme over everything in our lives, Lord God. Romans 3 verse 8 says, For this reason the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the evil one. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, says the word, Lord. 
we, we just confess your kingship over our lives over this world this morning lord lord we, we confess and we proclaim this morning that everything happens because you will it to happen lord god that nothing can happen in our lives that nothing can happen to us without your knowledge without you allowing it to happen lord god God we lift up one song to our God we lift up one voice we're singing hallelujah to our God we lift up one voice to our God we lift up one song to our God we lift up one voice singing hallelujah
praise Lord God. It was for freedom you have, that you have set us free. Galatians 5, chapter 1. Let us not be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The eternal God is our refuge and underneath us are his everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before us. I pray this morning, Lord Jesus, that all of us walk in absolute freedom and liberty, Lord God. We don't just want to sing songs to you, songs to you on Sunday morning, Lord God. But we want to experience freedom, your freedom in our lives, Lord. We are more than conquerors to you, Lord God. We are not victims in this world, but we are victors in this world, Lord God. We can do all things to Christ who strengthens us. And I pray this morning, Lord God, that you give us strength to face everything that we might be walking through in our lives, Lord God. Every obstacle, every fiery dart of the evil one, Lord. Any man or enemy that comes against us, Lord God, I pray you give us strength to deal with it, Lord God, to be victorious in it, Lord God. Father, we thank you for this time. We bless you for your presence in this place, Lord God. We love you with all of our hearts, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, O Lord, we pray. Greetings once again to each one of you in the master's name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So before today I can go into the word of God, I just want to give an important announcement. An announcement is that once again we are going to start the in-person services, Lord willing, by the first week of December. And it's been a long time that we have been online services, we have been in our homes, we have not been able to come together as a fellowship as a gathering of saints. But by the grace of God, we have been able to finalize a place and the venue uh, is the same which we were gathering before, just that we have got a larger space to gather, keeping in mind the physical distancing and other norms. So more details will be followed in the coming weeks. But once again, it's great to know that in a few weeks from now, we are once again going to have in-person services and we are looking forward for each one of us to come together and worship the living God, our God, in spirit and in truth, together face to face. I know it's been some months ago that people, when I used to go to visit the homes, they would ask me, when are we coming together? When are we coming together? When are we going to have in-person services? When we can gather together like how the earlier times? But yes, let's start praying and asking God the wisdom of how we can move forward as we are going to begin 
our in-person services. So today, even as we look into the Word of God, I want to talk to you about voices. We have heard a lot of voices. In fact, in the past few months, there are so many voices that are clamoring our attention and our mind. And there are so many voices that keep coming into our mind that changes our direction, that changes the pattern of our thinking. About a couple of weeks back, I was sharing to you about choices. And I was telling that, yes, we all have the freedom to make choices, but we don't have the freedom to choose the consequences of our choices. Well, today, as I'm going to share about voices and what the Bible says about voices, do you know that the voices that you hear has the power to influence the choices you make. So we have to be very careful about what voices are we hearing in our minds, in our spirits. In the year 1492, the people surrounding Columbus thought that the earth was flat. The experts examined his travel plans and said that his idea was impossible. They kept on discouraging him, saying, Columbus, don't ever think of going beyond your country or going to the other parts which you are thinking about your plans. But Columbus did not heed the advice. He did travel, but he did not fall off the end of the earth as they predicted. But he discovered America. Thomas Edison, another very famous inventor, he tried to persuade Henry Ford to abandon his fledging idea of a motor car because he was convinced it would never work. He told Ford, come work for me and do something worthwhile. Although Edison was a great inventor, it sounds like he was only positive about what he could do and very pessimistic about what others could do. So next time, when you get into your car or go somewhere in your car, be glad that Henry Ford did not share Edison's negative outlook on cars. My dear friends, don't let someone else's negative thinking, somebody else's negative voices limit you because negativity is contagious. And today we will look into a portion in the Bible about how a man, a godly king, he heard the voices and how did he respond? Let's turn our Bible to the book of Isaiah chapter 36. And in this particular passage, Isaiah mentions about a king of Judah called King Hezekiah. If you read about him in the book of 1 Kings and the book of Chronicles, yes, we come across that Hezekiah was a godly king. He brought up a lot of reforms. He wanted the people of Judah to come back to God. And he tried his level best of how he can restore godliness in the kingdom of Judah. By this time, the whole country of Israel was divided into northern kingdom and southern kingdom. By the time Hezekiah was on the throne in Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel, their capital Samaria, they all had been taken over into captivity by the Assyrian king. In Isaiah chapter 36, we follow into verse number 1. It says it was the 14th year of his rule. And the king of Assyria, King Sennacherib, he came against all the fortified cities of Judah and he took them. He took them under his rule, under his siege. Verse 2 says that the governor, his governor, his representative called the Rapsheka, he came with a great army from Lakshish to Jerusalem. And he was threatening Jerusalem. So King Hezekiah sent his representatives, Eliakim, Shebna, the scribe, and Joha, the recorder. They came to meet him. Verse number 4 of Isaiah chapter 36, it says, Rabshakeh said to the representatives of King Hezekiah, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? Can you imagine the confidence and the boasting of this particular Rabshakeh, the governor? the representative of king of Assyria. He says, thus says the king of Assyria. We always are used to hearing, thus says the Lord. But he's using that phrase for his king. And he says, 
what is your confidence in which you trust yes that's a question that sometimes we are faced with in our lives in what are we trusting where is our confidence and that is what this rub shaker is asking the representatives of king hezekiah basically eliakim shebna and joha verse 5 it says i say you speak of having plans and power for war but they are mere words in whom do you trust that you are rebelling against the king of assyria verse 6 is your confidence in egypt so he is telling egypt is already weak egypt is feeble you are thinking that egypt is going to come and help judah to fight against assyria verse number 7 is your confidence so are you trusting in the lord he is already declaring this rub shaker is already declaring that the lord god has forsaken you all and then he goes on to mock to ridicule the jews he says in verse number 8 even if i give you 2000 horses you won't find sufficient men to ride them what is trying to say that you don't have even 2000 men who can ride the horses of assyria verse 9 he says you can't challenge our weakest contingent with your tiny army he says your army it's so tiny so small even if a whole army come against our weakest contingent they can't challenge them and then what he says he went on speaking this words threatening words in the hearing of all the people he mocked them to strike terror into their hearts he knew that when people hear this threatening words they will be terrified and he goes on the whole uh, chapter verse 18 he says uh, be well lest hezekiah pursued you saying the lord will deliver us has any of the gods of the nations delivered its land from the land of the king of assyria what is trying to say in verse number 19 and 20 he says that you know the gods of different nations that came against king assyria this king of assyria destroyed them their gods could not do anything wrong anything evil against king of assyria then he goes on to say even the gods of samaria could not save them from the power of king assyria of assyria you can see the voice of boast here is this governor of assyria this representative of king senacherib and here he is threatening the people of god here indirectly is threatening king hezekiah who is in jerusalem and he is saying that where is your trust in whom are you confident in and then he went on mocking saying that you know you have nothing compared to what we are and that is how they were trying to bring in fear and sometimes in our lives we also hear voices of threat there are voices going all around sometimes satan's voice comes powerfully to our ears and to our minds sometimes people who are not for us will speak evil against us will threaten us sometimes our own people our own family our own friends some who are very close to us will keep on speaking this threatening words sometimes even our own past things will keep coming back reminding saying that oh this happened that happened and this i'm so terrified about all these things and we keep on hearing the voice of terror in our minds it's nothing new hezekiah heard it a few uh, centuries earlier a prophet heard it in the book of 1 kings chapter 19 it is prophet elijah after performing such great miracle on mount carmel the very next day queen jezebel sends elijah a message in verse number 2 of 1 kings chapter 19 elijah hears the voice of threat and this is what is the message which king jezebel sends through her messengers may the god strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow i have not killed you just as you kill the prophets of baal and asherah what happened when he heard this voice of threat the threatening words the enemy used those words to inject fear into elijah 
And that's one of the ways the enemy works into a person's life. The enemy works into a Christian life, a born-again Christian. He will bring threatening words and then he will inject fear into our hearts. What happened to Elijah? This great bold prophet, he says, verse 3, he was afraid. And in that fear, he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant over there. Elijah left the northern kingdom and went to Beersheba, that was in Judah, in the southern kingdom. Because he was terrified and he fled from the place where he is supposed to be, where God had planted him to be a prophet in that particular place to declare the righteousness of God and the holiness of God. Sometimes when we hear this voice of threat in our lives, what happens? We become fearful. Just like how this Rab Sheka came with a threatening voice with a great army to show his power before King Hezekiah. We may hear these threatening voices in our lives. Sometimes we hear the voice of deception. What are the voices? Not only threatening voice which brings in fear, but sometimes we hear voice of deception. In the book of Genesis chapter 3, we all know this particular passage, but I'm just going to go it quickly. In verse number 1, the B part, when the serpent comes and has a discussion with Eve, the serpent says, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? What was the serpent trying to do in this particular dialogue? The moment Eve started having a dialogue with the serpent, what happens? The serpent started sowing seeds of doubt and discontentment into Eve's heart. The voice of deception, that is how the enemy works also. And in that voice of deception, what will he do? He will bring in doubt. Well, Eve said, uh, we can eat of everything except for one tree which is in the middle of the garden. Uh, that tree is the knowledge of good and evil. God said, you should not eat of it. She added, saying that if you touch also, we will going to die. So what did the serpent say? Oh, be careful. Don't go near it. No, verse 4. It says, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. So what is the serpent trying to tell the woman? That God is speaking lies. The voice of deception will try to prove the truth to be a lie. And verse 5 it says, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So through this voice of deception, Eve fell into it. And then what happened, we all know, we are bearing the fruits. The whole mankind is bearing the fruits of that particular act discussion. My dear friends, whenever you hear the voice of deception, whenever the enemy comes in because the Bible says that he is a deceiver, his aim is to deceive people. He will clothe the falsehood with truth and say that this is the truth. And he wants to create doubts. He wants to inject doubts into your mind. And what happens? When we fall into it, when we start discussing, when we start uh, encouraging those thoughts into our minds, when we encourage those voices into our ears, what happens? We will fall prey to it. Just like how Eve fell prey to the voice of deception. What are the other voices apart from the voice of threat, voice of terror, and the voice of deception? There's a voice of ridicule. In the book of Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1, we all hear ridicule. People making fun of us. People mocking at us. And there was to be a time when you are born again, when you are baptized. People made all sorts of fun for the believers. They gave in different names to the Christians. In Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1, we know the story of Nehemiah very well. Nehemiah was a man who had a vision that I am going to build the walls of Jerusalem. The walls were broken the city was desolate and there was something in his heart which the Lord put into his heart that yes, I am going to build or rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And after doing all the groundwork, all the preparations almost done, as they have started this work, this great work, in chapter 4, verse 1, a guy called Sanballat, he comes. It says Sanballat was very angry when he learned that they were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage. And what did he do? 
he mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Samaritan army officers, what did he say? What does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they are doing? These are poor people. These are feeble. They are weakling. Some group of them are already in captivity. And what are these people doing? Do they think they can build a wall and offer sacrifices? What is in their mind? Do they want to build the walls of Jerusalem? Do they want to continue and start again the sacrificing to their God? Do they actually think that they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap? A charred ones at that. Those stones are burnt. It is lying in a heap. It's a rubble. From this rubble, do they think that they can build the walls of Jerusalem? Another guy comes in verse number 3. Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was standing beside Sanballat, he said, he remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. That much for motivation. And yes, there are times we also hear this type of voices. And especially when you have put your hand in to, to do something which God has taken hold of your life. And you are so excited and you are running with this vision. You are running with this mission in your life and say, yes, I want to do this. I want to do what God has put into my heart. And then all of a sudden, you have people like Sanballat. You have people like Tobiah. We have people, all this type of people who will come and who will ridicule your work. Who will ridicule of what you are doing. They will put you down. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 43, when David comes before Goliath. Yes, who is David? Just a young boy, shepherd, short, compared to Goliath who is a giant. And David goes with a sling and a few stones. What does Goliath said to David in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 43, the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? He is making fun of David. Well, for 40 days he has been making fun of King Saul and the whole army of Israel. Morning and evening, they all retreat in the moment he comes. And now all of a sudden he is saying that one young boy is coming. And then he did not stop him to make some sort of a fun and ridicule David saying that, do you think I'm a dog that you're coming with sticks? You're coming with a stone? And we all know with that stone, you can't kill even a dog. Maybe at the most, we can just shoo him off. And so this Philistine is saying that, do you think I'm a dog that you're coming with, uh, to me with the sticks? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. And then we know what happened later on. The voice of ridicule. And many people can get so affected and demoralized by the voice of ridicule that they would give up what God has called them for. What are the voices that you are hearing? Yes, there are sometimes you hear the voice of terror, threat, the voice of ridicule. And I want to tell you there is another voice which is called the voice of negativity. Enough of negativity. So much of negativity around in our life, in our world today. In the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 27. Again, we know this particular passage. It is a time when the 12 spies are coming back to meet Moses with their report. And this is what it says in verse number 27 of Numbers, chapter 13. This shows their report to Moses. They gave their report and they said, We enter the land you sent us to explore. And it is indeed a bountiful country. Fantastic, as the Lord had said, promised, everything is fine. Land flowing with milk and honey. See the fruit. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. So we have bought some fruits as a proof of the fruitfulness of that land. Verse 28. But the people living there are powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Enoch. That's it. We saw giants. We saw people who were powerful. We saw those cities that are fortified and strong. How on earth do you think, Moses, that we are going to enter this land? 
how on earth do you think this Moses that once we enter this land, we're going to conquer this land and take away these people and own this land? It looks impossible. In fact, they were all thinking about what's gone wrong with Moses giving us this fantasy, giving us this nice fairy tale and now gave us this great dream but we know this is not going to come to pass. Verse 31, it says, the other man would explore the land with him. They disagreed because when Caleb said that God is with us, we will overcome. Let us go and take possession of it at once. What does this mean? The ten spies say, no, no, we cannot take it. We cannot overcome them. We are like grasshoppers before them. And they said, we cannot go against them because they are stronger than we are. What happened? They were all remembering the days of Egypt. They all cried, Bible says in the book of Numbers, chapter 14. They all cried that night, not out of joy. Oh, wow, we are almost on the verge of the promised land. Oh, we are feeling so emotional. God promised to Abraham, our forefather, this particular land. And now we are the ones, after so many generations, we are the ones who are going to actually inherit that land. No, they are not crying because of that. They are just crying because they cannot go into the promised land. They have already made up their mind that it is impossible. They are complaining and then they are remembering their so-called golden days of Egypt. They are saying, why on earth had you you come to Egypt and bring us out of Egypt. We were well settled in Egypt. We were happy there. We only know how happy they were in the book of Exodus, the earlier chapters. And we see then later on in Numbers 14, Joshua rises up and encourages the people and says, come on, let us go. If God is with us, these people, the Anakites and the people of the land of Canaan are like bread before us. You know what happens? Verse number 10, all these 10 spies gather all the people and they rose to stone Joshua. Can you see? The voice of negativity and what effect it had on those ten spies and the whole camp of Israel. They made wrong choices because they were listening to the voice of negativity. And there are times in our lives that we also tend to give in to the negative voices that we hear. Negative feelings negative thoughts and then we can only see is negative. We cannot see in clarity what God wants to show to us. But we are only seeing everything is negative. And we all know that that particular generation perished in the wilderness. They could not inherit the promised land, the land of Canaan. So what are the voices? The voice of threat, the voice of deception, the voice of ridicule, the voice of negativity. There are a few more voices. You can get much more voices. Voice of opposition. Sometimes when you want to move forward and ahead with God, people will oppose you. And one of the classic examples which I was just thinking about is found in the book of Mark, Gospel of Mark chapter 10. And this is an account which I shared some months back of a blind beggar called Bartimaeus. Mark chapter 10 verse 46 to 52. We will not read the whole passage. But in verse 48... In fact, verse 47, we, we know that Bartimaeus is crying out to Jesus the moment he heard that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by the uh, road of Jericho. He cries out to Jesus and saying that Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He keeps on crying. And in verse 48, many want him to be quiet. He told him, you shut up. You keep quiet. You are a beggar. You have got nothing to do. You are not worthwhile to stand before Jesus. That's what they might be thinking. And they warned him. It is not that they just told him or requested him kindly. They warned him to be quiet. But what happened? When he heard the voice of opposition telling him to be quiet, Bible says, he cried out all the more, saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. Opposition did not stop Bartimaeus to reach out to Jesus because he knew no matter how hard the opposition, no matter how big the opposition, but I am going to reach out to my God, to my Savior. And that is what you and I need to do in these times. When we face opposition as you move forward, we are not called to retreat. We are not called to pull back. We are not called to look back. But we are called to move forward. We are called to reach forward to what God has in store for us. 
what what is your response or your reaction when you hear voice of opposition the next is the voice of this destruction yes we can see a lot of destruction around maybe not a lot of physical destruction but yes there's a lot of emotional destruction taking place today relationship destruction people who are losing their lives through through this pandemic and when we see all this what happens your mind gets filled with those voices and those thoughts of destruction and you start thinking oh yes death is round the corner and that's what happened to gehazi the servant of prophet elisha in the book of second chapter 6 gehazi woke up from his tent and he looked around he saw that the whole city was surrounded by the syrian army and this army are now marching forward towards this hill called dotham now going to come and capture elisha and also the servant gehazi and the moment the servant sees this scenario that the whole our city and the hill is surrounded by this great army of syria he cries out he goes back to his master he says the servant of the man god of god arose early and went out there's an army surrounding the city with horses and chariot and his servant said to elisha the prophet alas my master what shall we do we are now dead we are sitting ducks before this army this great army we have we don't know what is warfare we only know to pray to god that's it but in front of this great army we are sitting ducks verse 16 the voice of destruction has come they can see destruction the enemy the army totally against them but in verse 16 prophet of god elisha a man who had seen and experienced god in a powerful way means calm remains cool he knows there is something supernatural he answered to and said to the servant do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them elisha prayed and said lord i pray open his eyes that he may see the lord opened the eyes of the servant of this young man and he saw and behold the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around elisha one side there's a voice of destruction the other side there's a man of faith who stood knowing there's divine protection the voice of destruction can cause many a people to stop in their track to stop in their life and also maybe to give up their life because they see no way out so we have gone through the voice of threat the voice of deception the voice of ridicule the voice of negativity the voice of opposition the voice of destruction there are times people face the voice of condemnation we hear condemning voices you are not good you are good for nothing nothing will work up into your life so evil so bad and sometimes we try to walk you are trying to walk this christian life it does is not happening you are trying to reform yourself but it's not happening again keep falling and then the enemy brings in guilt the enemy brings in all this condemning voices saying that no yes you can see god doesn't love you god cannot take care of you you are good for nothing christian you will not be able to make up your life you will not be able to make it to heaven and all this condemning voices pulls you back into the world and into sin and that's what happened in john chapter 8 we know this when the pharisees and the leaders of jews had captured had got this lady this woman and they said in john chapter 8 verse number 3 as jesus was speaking the teachers of religious law and pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery so she was really they have evidences that she was committing that particular sin they put her in front of the crowd and they said to jesus teacher this woman was caught in the act of adultery the law of moses says to stone her what do you have to say the religious people are voicing out the voice of condemnation on this woman we all know i'll not read the passage but we all know what jesus did he started writing on the uh, ground with his finger and then he stands up and then he says in verse number 7 uh, when they kept demanding he stood up and he said all right let the one who has never sinned be the first one to throw the stone at her 
And then again he stopped, he stooped down and he started writing the dust. When the accusers heard all this, they slipped away one by one. They threw their stones which they had picked up to stone her. They threw the stone one by one and they went away from that place. In verse number 10 of John chapter 8, Jesus stood up again and said to the woman now, she, the woman is there and Jesus is there. And he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Did not even one of them condemn you? Not one of them could condemn you. A few verses earlier, those condemning voices, condemnation, that yes, we have got enough evidences and proof that this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And yes, we are very righteous. This woman deserves to be stoned to death. What happens? Jesus comes to the scene. In fact, they picked up Jesus to trap him. But in fact, they got trapped. And then Jesus says, there is not a single person to condemn you. Then she says, no Lord. So Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus was the only one who could condemn her because he was righteous, he was sinless. But he exercised mercy in that place. Sometimes we get so much bound by the voice of condemnation into our lives that we cannot see that we have a God of grace, a God who is willing to forgive us when we confess our sins and is willing to give us a fresh new start. And finally, the voice of temptation. The enemy is all around, tempt, especially born again Christians, people who are in the children of light. He is there to tempt them, to cause them to fall and bring them into the kingdom of darkness. And we see this account in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 onwards till verse number 10. How Satan himself comes and comes before Jesus and he tempts Jesus. My dear friends, if there's any Christian who's saying that I'm never tempted, I'm telling you, my dear friend, if Satan did not leave Jesus from tempting him, you are no greater than Jesus. We all face temptation, but God desires that we don't fall into temptation, but overcome temptation. And we know that particular passage, how Jesus was tempted is Satan in three different aspects. And in all those three aspects, Jesus spoke the word of God. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. My dear friends, there are voices that are going on in your mind. Even as you're listening today, there are different voices clamoring for your attention, for your mind. If you heed the wrong voices, if you pay attention to the wrong voices, it will cause you to make wrong decisions. It's very important whose voice are you hearing. Coming back to our same passage that we began, Book of Isaiah chapter 36. As Rabshaka uttered voices of threat, as he uttered voices of ridicule, as he uttered voices of boasting, and he was telling, you know, don't believe in Hezekiah. Don't believe what he's saying that the Lord will come and save you all. No way. No God has been able to stand against the king of Assyria. Look at all the lands. King Hezekiah had told these three representatives. When you are listening to this Rabshakeh, don't reply to him. Look in your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 36, verse 21. It says, those three representatives of King Hezekiah says, they held their peace and answered him not a word because this was King Hezekiah's commandment. Do not answer him. And that is what we need to do. Eve started having a dialogue with the serpent and she fell into the temptation. Jesus spoke the word and told Satan that he has got no room in his life. And here Hezekiah says, that don't answer him, don't reply and don't get into discussion. And later on, if you read chapter 37, maybe it's a good uh, time this week that you could read chapter 37, we can see how Hezekiah, he prays to his God. Bible says in verse number 1 of chapter 37, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. 
And then he sent a word to prophet Isaiah. And he told, go and tell prophet Isaiah to seek the Lord and to pray to the Lord. And Isaiah replied back saying that, do not worry King Hezekiah. Don't be afraid of those words of this king. Because he has blasphemed the name of the Lord God. God will send a spirit of confusion in him. And he will go away from Jerusalem. And he will fight a war with somebody else. And finally he will be destroyed in his own land. And when he hears that, Hezekiah prays once again. And then again God answers through this prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah says, God has delivered you Hezekiah. God has delivered Jerusalem. And what we see towards the end of the chapter, chapter 37, verse 36, it says, The angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. Sometime back in chapter 36, Rabshaka was boasting. Where are you even? You got 2,000 people? I'll give you 2,000 horses, but you don't have 2,000 men to ride those horses. Where is your army? Your army is so tiny that our weakest contingent will fight and win against you. But Rabshaka did not know that they were fighting against the living God. And that living God is for you and for me. He is standing beside us when we stand with him. Hezekiah knew it. And instead of going and fighting against the king of Assyria, he went before the throne of God. He started seeking the face of God. He started seeking the prophet of God. And the prophet said that God will vindicate you as, as uh, Hezekiah. God will deliver Jerusalem. It says that God sent an angel. They had never fought with the angel of the living God. Mind you. One angel killing 185,000. Assyrian army men. All were dead by early morning. Then we see in verse number 37, Sennacherib goes back to Nineveh. And in verse number 38, he says that later on, he is killed by his own sons. You don't require any other enemy. His own sons killed him when he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god. When he was in the house of his god, his own sons killed him. My dear friends, Whose voice are you hearing? Are you giving attention to the voice of the threat? I'm going to tell you today, hear the voice of confidence. Are you listening to the voice of deception? Give heed to the voice of truth. Are you hearing the voice of ridicule? Hear the voice of affirmation. Are you listening to the voice of negativity? Change it and hear the voice of faith. Are you listening to the voice of opposition? Listen to the voice of the overcoming. That in Christ Jesus, you are more than a conqueror. Are you listening to the voice of destruction? Know that there is a God and His voice is saying that there is divine protection. Even though I may walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for God is with me. His rod and His staff they comfort me. Are you listening to the voice of condemnation? Turn and listen to the voice of acceptance. Jesus has accepted you the way you are. Are you listening to the voice of temptation? Listen to God's voice. The word of God. Because when you start listening to the voice of heaven, the voice of the earth will diminish. When light shines upon your life, darkness will will be dispelled from your life. So today I want to encourage you my dear friends that just how God answered in the life of King Hezekiah and delivered him, he did not pay attention to the voice of threat. My dear friends, in this particular season, let us heed the voice of God. Let us say we want to be the people who will hear the voice of heaven in our lives. Let heaven come and invade my life so that I can become a agent of change in my earth, in my earthly life. Let's pray this time and let's commit our lives, let's commit all that we have got around our lives into the Lord's and say, Lord, give me a year that may, I may listen to your voice and not to the voice of the enemy. Dear Father, we want to thank you, O God, for this time. And Father, we pray, O God, that we shall be the people who will be the listeners of your voice. There are many voices 
that are clamoring for our attention. But in the midst of all this clamor and confusion, we want to be the people who will hear the voice of God. And Father, we pray, tune our hearts, our ears, that we may be recipient to hear your voice in our lives. And Father, that we shall be those people who will be obedient to your word, Father God. Strengthen us, forgive us when we have failed. Help us to have a walk that is worthy of your calling. In Jesus' mighty name we ask. Amen. Chariots of fire Coming through the clouds I've heard about Yeah, I've heard about The words you would speak Causing dead men to rise They're coming out from underground I wanna see love of our Heavenly Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. Amen. God bless you all.